we either could go to very rigid, you know, shutdown mm -hmm. of us, or we can go to liberation. Mm -hmm. To admit what we do not know, I think is, is it would be bold um, right now to say we are not totally sure what just happened, why it happened, um, or what to do next. And we also have a history, a legacy of movement work, of thinking, of coming mm -hmm. together, of reaching into places that seem or um, are isolated um, and bringing folks into a movement. Um, I think our, our, our job is um, screaming at us. become a people, and more to the point, we must. That may not be the message you took from the results of the 2016 election, but it is the message of today's guests. The winner-take-all electoral map of this country isn't an accurate reflection of where we live. Everywhere there are people with high ideals working for a better shared future, including in all those red states. In fact, activists from the South may be especially worth progressives paying attention to, even though in our media they're usually left out. Suzanne Farr and Stephanie Gilliu have been doing radical work in so-called red states for decades. Farr, the author of movement classics like Homophobia, A Weapon of Sexism, and In the Time of the Right, used to head up the Arkansas Women's Project, and after that, the Highlander Center in Tennessee, the movement training school that graduated, among others, Dr. King and Rosa Parks. Farr was one of the founders of Southerners on New Ground, a group that Stephanie came up through. Now, Gilliu co-directs Project South, which has been part of a Southern movement assembly process seeking to build local governance power since Hurricane Katrina days. They both see crisis and opportunity in the moment we're in right now. Crisis if activists, especially Northern liberals, go narrow and start pointing fingers. Opportunity if we go broad with open hearts. Here's Stephanie Gilliu and Suzanne Farr. Many of us have been working for years on talking about the development of the right wing and talking about the development of neoliberalism. And in, you know, beginning to, we began to realize how they were actually kind of marrying in their, in their work you know, and in their, in their strategy and, and what they were going to try, trying to accomplish. I think one of the, the first things that hit was the amount and veracity of misinformation, uh, misconclusions uh, in terms of half the country just voted the KKK into the presidency. One, that's inaccurate. Um, the numbers just isn't true. And part of that has been a massive and systemic disenfranchisement effort by uh, right-wing forces, by the establishment itself. The good that has come out of this, it was like an awakening moment. You know, it's a moment of getting lots of information, being able to get lots of information from us who do this work all the time, but also getting uh, information through various forms of, forms of media and maybe in, in interesting kind of ways through Facebook, you know, where, where people brought their opinions so much. But I think in terms of those of us doing the work, this, we have this bulk of information now to work with. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's, I think that's a positive thing. I think uh, the other thing that has happened is people see this as not just a political crisis, but a spiritual crisis. And I'm, I don't mean spiritual in, the, you know, in a church sense or that kind of sense, but in a sense of kind of looking for a moral core, you know? Wondering how, where that is and how you shape that more and how you shape that around with the politic and how you bring people to a place where, where they can express, feel and express compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all on, the, on that, all of, <laughs> we're on that path. <laughs> I gotta say, all of us are on that path, but we're on that path mm -hmm. of um, moving, moving to liberation. And 
the good news for us is, us and many people like us, we've been on that path for a long time. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a, oh, this is popular now, this is popular now, but on that steady path. Mm -hmm. We learn from this election, those of us who have been movement people, is that we hadn't finished the job of linking together uh, race and gender and class. And in all of our work, in the women's movement, you know, race fell off. And the uh, economic justice movement, also a lot of race fell off and gender fell off, you know? So there's, there's now, I think, clear evidence that if you don't have all of those, th those three things going in terms of the impact that racism has, the impact that economic injustice has, the impact that sexism has, then you're not gonna get a collective group of people. I do think it's a misread to blame blocks of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think what it's not necessarily about white people, but it is about a culture of white supremacy, a right. culture of racism, a culture of violence that got stirred up, unleashed. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what we need to be organizing around rather than sort of a misread or a um, not full conclusion about uh, the number of people who did X or Y in terms of this mm -hmm. particular vote. We have much more at stake. Um, and what I think our job as movement folks is to do is to highlight and be very explicit about the real consequences. Not identity politics, um, not just a general sort of moral high ground, but the real consequences mm -hmm. in people's mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. all people's the lives, impact. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, what this is gonna mean for rural folks, families, uh, queer people, uh, folks inside, uh, black folks, black young people who voted for the first time and feel betrayed by the entire situation um, and are going to be looking for movements that um, care and lean in and open up to, uh, to, to their realities. Um, and that feels like a very much uh, a better focus. And I do think it's a time to, um, to, to investigate where do we focus our, our energies, our resources, our, our our ability to think critically about this moment, what has changed? I, for a long time, have, have had, had interest, I guess I would say, in whether a woman is going to be elected president or not, you know. And that was sort of my last goal, you know. Much, much bigger goal for me was, could we end violence in the lives of women? Could we find any women anywhere who could actually say, I have had a life without violence. I mean, that, that to me is such a larger goal than whether we have a woman as president. Two things that came out really strongly from the most recent Southern Movement Assembly um, is one, a demand for community infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that means led by and resourced by the community itself, a recognition of how many resources we actually do have. Um, as counselors, as nurses, as practitioners, as engineers, um, as students, as young people, um, folks that know how to de-escalate conflict, folks that have been trained to work with each other and think through these things. Um, how do we create centers of liberated space for folks to do that? Any community could come together and start to build out, and that could be, doesn't necessarily need to be a building, but a place, uh, uh, a way to come together to do that education, to mm -hmm. ask those questions, et cetera. The other really strong uh, demand from the ground, and, and, um, and I think uh, not just demand, but like commitment from the ground is around local governance. What does that mean on city councils, school boards, um, and in, in official capacities, but also um, how do we take on the, the, the clarity of our own community leadership um, and bring in solutions where they're gonna let us down. Um, they've let us down. They have, um, they have left uh, in, in many ways, and they're going to also turn that vacuum into a lot of violent attack, whether it's um, social hostility and violence or, uh, and horizontal violence or um, state violence. A lot of people are looking at the Rust Belt as a place that needs attention. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it still important to pay attention to the South, Suzanne, is it? Well, you know, we're in the Rust Belt are very related, <laughs> you know. It's, you have the down south and you have the up south, you know. That's what, that during our, our great loss of, of people and of jobs, there was the migration, migration to, to that. And so 
people are paying attention to it because they feel like this is a place who, that feels it, feels it most, and it feels the loss most. We continue in the f feeling that loss in the South. It has been a sustained loss and it continues to be a loss, whether it's about jobs or whether it's about our land, whether it's about gentrification of you know, how our communities have changed that loss feels, the displacement of people in the South feels dreadful. But I think you're gonna find in the future, we're gonna look at both of those. The whole country's gonna go through this, but they're gonna look at both of those very, very closely. Because if people are angry about the displacement now, they're gonna be ever so much angrier in the next election and certainly in the election after that, eight years out, because of the displacement that will come through the fact that we are in a revolution. And I think that that's been a hard concept for people to take on, that we had the agrarian revolution into the industrial revolution. You know, that, that revolution affected people tremendously as they moved in from farms. And now you have a major technological revolution that is going to eliminate jobs. We have to build what life is going to be like under those, under those circumstances. I think these centers that Steph's talking about, those, those are part of that. Then there's the whole idea of figuring out what work is going to be and how, to, how does one get money, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. compensation or whether it's, maybe it's barter, whether it's whatever. Those are really deep conversations. I think they will, are taking place in the South now and certainly in the Rust Belt. And I think those two places talking together at this moment yeah. would be, a, that's the reason we talk, uh, when we talk in the Southern Movement Assembly, we talk about mm -hmm. down South and up South and global South mm -hmm. and seeing all of those tremendously link. Does that leave out part of the country? No, but it, it's, uh, it's the train, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's an old fashioned word, train <laughs> <laughs> for, for, that, for that thinking and for that, that messaging. And so I think after this election, we just have to dig deeper in that because that was one of the learnings that people who have been so impacted economically put aside a lot of other concerns you know so it wasn't just just the right wing you know messaging it was those real concerns that came out of the effect of neoliberalism that's stephanie gilieu and suzanne farr there's more to come but take a break do you want to learn more about the groups these women are part of? Come to our website and find links. If you want to support programming like this or subscribe to our YouTube or iTunes account, you can do it right at our website and have this content coming directly to your mobile device. There's more ahead. Next up, we talk about some of the global connections for the work taking place in the South today. Here's Stephanie Gilieu from Project South. At the US South specifically has a lot in common with the global South. And as we're watching uh, Trump's rise in a lot of different places, we heard a, a very um, specific call to action from the Philippines and what Duterte means that there, um, what it looks like in the European Union and across what is also uh, a, a, an economic implosion, uh, a refugee and migrant crisis at a scale and scope that we don't have any sense of. But the U.S. South, how we relate to um, the Caribbean the, and, and many other places mm -hmm. in terms of the historical struggle and the historical wins in these regions um, can also be a guide. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that part is actually exciting and similar to 9-11 and that moment when there was an opportunity to really claim and work solidarity with in terms of in a call to solidarity, mm -hmm. we became narrow, militarized right. and vengeance, so, vengeful. So this, this is go wide, you know, go is wide, the message. Connect, share. Uh, deepen, tie movements, liberation movements to liberation movements. Um, there's opportunity here, and but I don't want to uh, downplay um, the level to which we are also going to need to build infrastructure to protect and defend our folks. Mm -hmm. um, and the folks that are going to be facing the legal frameworks that also came out of 9-11 are set to go um, in terms of attacking uh, Muslim folks, uh, folks from around the country now, how that looks like, uh, how do we protect and defend dissent in this time, I think is a big question, um, so that we can connect with liberation movements across the globe. What I love about the work that I'm doing, uh, particularly the work with the uh, Southern Movement Assembly and Project South, and that it, it, um, it rests me in the future, you know? And I, th I think that, may, that feeling may go across age, but it particularly feels strong at, at the age I am. 
And by resting in the future, it is, it is a multiracial environment of, of people looking at what can be built. You know, there's plenty of talk all the time about what's happening and what, you know, how we have to intervene in that and how we have to defend ourselves. But this idea that we can, uh, we can become a people through a process of building an infrastructure, but in more importantly, by a process of building shared values and shared uh, principles. And that, that, that leads us to, you know, a very long dream of mine and many others in the South for the concept of the possibility of beloved community. And that, that has become for many of us the highest ideal. Given a lot of the dynamics that we've talked about in terms of what's at stake, what is in danger, and what's growing, we're in a 21st century moment. Mm -hmm. um, so that means the questions are different. Um, so our solutions are going to be. And the more we spend time investigating and examining um, both what we uh, do know and can build from, but what we need to reimagine um, is very important right now. And I'm excited about that work at the same time that I'm braced for the crisis ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as uh, someone, you know, uh, pushing 40, I think it's important, <laughs> you know, like this is where we have to flex. This is where we have to um, name those political homes, invite people in and say, let's go, let's build together um, because we have, to, we have to reimagine the entire thing. And that is scary, but also very exciting.